construction structure right there. Pretty solid, but uh, for the most part, it needs a new floor because we tore it apart because it was wet. Still have a couple of projects that will come back to life. Um, got the 310 and I've got the 390 pop-up kit, like 30 bucks, you know what I'm saying? That's still going to happen. The checkmate is essentially complete. We've been putting it in the water. Going to do a better job with a transom saver. The motor itself is going to get a set of reed valves for the outboard types. But it's ready to go. I'm, we're having a lot of fun with it. The lights are on on this boat. We had this motor running in one of the prior videos. And my wife has done a stunning job of, of painting it. And we ripped the floor out. And this is actually a really cool boat. Basically what you have is you don't have stringers in the conventional sense. I mean it has stringers and they turned out to be pretty solid. The plywood on the floor was about the only thing that was was uh, was rotted and the foam was not that wet. We thought it would be saturated but it's really not. Uh, we're not going to go crazy with it because it's not nearly as wet as I thought it would be. So we just cut out the floor and uh, we got some marine plywood we're going to set right back in there and glass it in. That'll be a video for the fishing channel. And uh, Rainy day stuff. I'm really looking forward to getting this one in the water. And that motor yet again, we put a impeller kit in there, some seals, and put the aftermarket wiring kit and fuel lines in that motor. It runs beautifully. This, I don't know, it's not the best I've seen. But usually on marine grade you have more plies and less gaps. That's, that's why you buy it. That almost looks like just exterior grade. But it does have a smooth finish. They, they sell it as marine grade. The glue is the same on the marine grade as a exterior grade plywood. But there's supposed to be a lot more plies. And one other piece. I found this company that makes full fuel line kits for the old Mercury's. And they do a really nice job. So i got to plug them on my fishing channel. Now, I got that kit for my 125 horse in line 6. But they make them for pretty much all of them. Really, 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 really valuable stuff to find that as a, as a resource. And... And I will definitely give them feedback. But I am just absolutely tickled to death that I found these folks. I think it was like 150 bucks delivered. And I have to get a bunch of these fuel line kits because I have a bunch of other inline sixes that I'm going to go through. And I've got a couple of 65s. And they also sell them for the 65 horse. Really, 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 really good resource. Because fuel lines and wiring harnesses are the two places where you have to spend a lot of time on these old Mercury's.
a continuation of the build that Bob and I are putting together. And that's going to be based on a, this is the starting point, the 48 millimeter version of that Husqvarna 365, 372 series. And then with the John Threads, it's the 2165 and the 2171, not the 72. And I guess you can wrap in the 2065 and the 2072 as well. But basically, it's a 48 millimeter version of that uh, 372 class saw. Closed port, round intake, and some of the early versions of this saw had a square kind of an intake. But as I was going through, I realized yet again how sometimes hard it is to piece together one of these from scratch. It's so much better to start with a complete saw and then work your way back. I mean, Bob provided that. With a John's Reg, you have to have a different chain brake handle that's more straight to coincide with the handlebar. This one here is from a 2172 and so is that one so they're going to be a little bit taller. Uh, this was a new one that Bob had sent up and again it's more straight relative to the Husqvarna's. They don't swap. And of course the red handle and one of the things you'll see on the John thread is the location of those screws is further apart on the John thread than on the Husqvarna. So stuff like that you got to pay attention to when you start piecing together this kind of a saw. Got a helicopter going over. Top cover. Side cover and make sure you have a chain adjuster as well as this rubber baffle. So you got to start like building a list of all the bits and pieces you need to make this thing happen. Now you saw me put together the crank that had the bearings. It's got the bar studs on these, these cases, plus the case screws and the gasket. So that's a bunch of stuff right there. But I still have to put in seals, right? Here's some case seals. These are OEMs. They've been sitting around for a while. Got to clean them up. But they're new OEM. And uh, everything's going to be OEM. I'm going to put into this saw with with one or two very minor exceptions. So the case, the crank, the bearings, the gasket, the case screws, you know, all that stuff. Seals, you know. Muffler. Gotta have a muffler. Muffler gaskets. There's a steel baffle that goes right there. Let me go see if I can find one. Bracket. All this stuff adds up. All this stuff is money. Figure out which ones I want. You know what I'm saying? It adds up. So what I'm going to do now is I am missing one of these for 372. That's what I'm missing at this point in time. But I'm also missing a red version of this uh, support bracket, I guess, carburetor support bracket. So those two, are, those are the two pieces that I'm missing. Now I had a 390 right here that would provide possibly chain brake parts, the band, the internals. This plastic is the same on a 390 as a 372 as well as this chain brake lever. So I've got all the bits and pieces for the chain brake and uh, I need one of those. But I also need the bar oil pump. So I've got that out of this piece of this saw right here. So I'm having to dive deep into the parts bin to get some of those pieces. So let's begin. Let's just go right through it real fast. You need the handle. Obviously you need the screws for the bar, handle bar. 
throttle cable, all this. They need the whole handle assembly, the trigger, the safety, the spring, the uh, anti-vibe springs. Got one of those for the handlebar there. I've got a few down here to supplement, so what I don't have here I have from my junk pile. Cover, and you need the cover screws on these. It's got to come with the, with the screws. Cases, I have to include the bearings, crank, gasket, bar studs, seals. And while I'm on the subject of of the tank, obviously you have to put a fuel line in there, right? Oil pump with their special screws. They're special. They have a special length and they usually have a kind of locking nylon that's molded onto the threads. But you also have to have the little oil line and this grommet that goes into the oil pump. That right there is something that people will forget. And the other one is this little piece here that goes underneath the side cover here, underneath the guide plate. That's a piece that people will forget when they're doing their saws. That little copper tube with the grommet underneath the guide plate. The guide plate with that special screw right there, that also is something people will forget. And then with a chain break, you're going to have that cover. Notice this is from a 372, but this is a 390. It interchanges. And inside the chain brake, you're going to have the spring. Um, there's a detent spring. I'll show you that after the lever. I've got some of that stuff right here. Right? The kind of things that you also will not have when you need them are these little pint-sized screws which hold that cover on. It takes four of them. And we'll get into that when we do the final assembly. But while I'm on that side, there's a couple of other pieces for 372 which are unique. These little O-rings. Okay. This sleeve right here is what rides over the crank and the worm gear for the oil pump rides on this. And this little O-ring here goes on the crank first before you slide this on there and seals. There's like a chamfer on the inside of that uh, sleeve. And that little O-ring sits right there and seals up against the bearing and takes away one of the air leaks. This is something you don't see on the Chinese kits. It does matter. I mean, it's not uh, huge, but it, it's something that over time does matter. And I always put those in my 372s. So that, that's alongside the crank. And then, of course, you have the things like your clutch and sprocket and, you know, clutch drum and all that kind of thing. Things like that little O-ring people were gonna, you're going to forget. A little grommet like that can be the difference between running your saw and not for the, for the oil pump. You know, things like that you got to keep in mind. I'm going to use, I'm going to use the newest of the ignition modules that Husky sells for the 372 X Torque. Now, there's going to be a big argument about that, but I'm not going to get into it right now in detail, but the 2165 or 365 48 millimeter was designed to have a no load of like 12.5. These go up to 13.3. Well, I'm going to bring up the RPMs on that 48 millimeter to where it's comfortable with a no load in the, three, in the 13,000, 13,200 range, that range. And that ignition works beautifully. And it generates spark at a lower RPM than some of the earlier versions, so it makes it easier to start. And another thing I'm going to use is one of the older flywheels with a little bit less fins. The reason is it has a little bit less weight, so it, it'll accelerate a little quicker. And remember, when you're doing flywheel, there's another couple of things people will forget. You want that washer between the flywheel and nut and the flywheel. So here's the nut, here's a washer. This is off a of saw. Um, there's actually a part number for them. So the nut, the washer on the flywheel side, obviously make sure you've got the dogs and the springs for your pull start, stuff like that. 
but all the stuff adds up. I mean, this thing right here will nickel and dime you. And back to the chain brake, you got this spring assembly right here. You got to make sure you got that little pin. That's the kind of thing that'll keep you from finishing it. The spring, obviously. But here's another one that rides up against the case. That little piece of plastic. Think things like that, like that little piece of plastic right there. Cylinder. You need the right length screws to hold the cylinder down. You need that baffle. You need the brace. You need a gasket. You need the muffler. So here's a couple of things. That. That goes over that hole. That little bushing. And I don't use I don't use one of these. I use just a plug. Okay, more intake, more cylinder stuff. You're going to need a boot. I'm going to use an, uh, the original edition style boot. A carburetor. Well, I'm going to cut that boot, rotate it, so I can use one of these mini X torque carburetors, and I'm not sure which one I'm going to use. Along with a carburetor, along with a boot, you need that little, and here's another one, you need that little support ring right there that goes on the end of the, of the intake boot. You've got to have that, right? You've got to have a clamp. Again, little things that will nickel and dime you. On the other end of the carburetor, you need a filter holder and an air filter. Right? And on the air filter, you need that little spring. Another thing that will bite you if you don't have one. Chinese OEM. This is the for the throttle cable. And the key on this is, for whatever reason, the Chinese version is a little bit short so if you put it in a stock saw build you sometimes won't get the full throttle that's a downside obviously so you want to go with the OEM version but on the conversion build that I'm using the X torque carburetor actually that helps I know it's goofy but it does so we'll decide which of these we're going to use because oftentimes when I've done the conversion I've had to modify these little oh that's another piece right there that takes the, the throttle cable. I've had to modify those um, so that it actually relaxes to idle. And on some saws, or sometimes when I use these Chinese aftermarket ones, since they're they're not machined properly for the stock saw, they effectively keep me from having to modify that little cam right there. I'm using the original edition style filter holder, even though I have an X-Torque carburetor, because yet again I'm going to rotate that carburetor. Good news and bad news. On the carburetors, most should just stick with the original edition version. I'm going to use the X-Torque carburetor because it has a little bit bigger bore. Um, I mean, we can argue about the theory because really, are you going to make a big difference because the inside diameter the inside diameter of the boot hasn't changed, right? Continuing on, you're going to need the anti-vibe that goes into the cylinder, right? You're going to need a choke lever, support bracket, you're going to need that anti-vibe right there, carburetor hooks, the, the uh, filter holder hooks onto that, it has to have the grommet, and this is for the tank vent. And I'm going to use I'm going to use this piston right here. I did this on the first one I built, and it worked just fine. I get guys going crazy about how it's inferior for a whole variety of reasons, and it may be, but it works. You know what I'm saying? And it's cheap. It's like thirty bucks. These guys had it to me in two days, so I'm going to give them a plug. The product they sell is made by VEC in India. So there's a variety of different places to get them. 
but they've treated me well, so I'm going to continue to use them. And the reason I'm using this piston is because it has the pop-up. And the reason why that makes a difference is if you look really carefully on the inside of the combustion chamber, it's really not a really good machining. So, I mean, what I should do on this cylinder if I really wanted to do this saw right and I just don't have the time is to take an arbor and go in there and cut the combustion chamber switch band to a flat and then mill the corresponding distance off the base of the cylinder and it's going to run good enough with what I'm doing to it that I'm not going to go to that extra step just yet that might be a future video the pop-up on this what it really does is it reduces the, the volume of the combustion chamber and I'm not going to get into a whole lot of theory right now but I prefer the pop-up concept when I drop the cylinder because I have less interference at bottom dead center with the piston and the transfers which means I don't have to do as much grinding on the transfers to still you know achieve the performance I'm looking for and I get a very simple compression increase which is what you do when you drop a cylinder but because it's a pop-up versus just dropping the cylinder the interference of the piston at bottom dead center is quite a bit less one of the anomalies when you start talking about porting and stuff like that again I'm just gonna brush over it is you see builders well they'll machine the base of the cylinder you know a lot 40 thousandths well, that makes that thinner right but you're also increasing the compression because that's usually why you do it is to move the whole cylinder down it does some things to port timing and it does some things to compression that people like but when that cylinder has moved down say 40 thousandths and the pistons where it was that means the piston interferes 40 thousandths at bottom dead center um, into the transfers when they're supposed to be wide open they're now somewhat closed by the piston plus there's a sharp square edge of that piston you know Imagine this muffler, imagine that being the transfer. Imagine this being the piston at bottom dead center. It comes down here. It wants the transfer port to be wide open. But now you move the cylinder down. So now your piston's here. It didn't change. But your transfer port is quite a bit uh, closed off. When you take a pop-up, what you've done is you've machined the top of the piston just a little bit so you're actually maybe cutting that interference in half if not more depending on how much you dropped your cylinder which means you don't have to do as much work on the top edge of the transfer in order to get that cross-sectional area back and one of the things you'll see with the builds is when they've really chopped that base of the cylinder down a lot you see these like crazy blowdown numbers and that's because they've had to really change the upper edge of the transfer for two things one because you do have that piston interference you see the guys will really put a sharp angle on the top of the transfer and what that does is it helps the flow as the gases are coming up from the bottom end because you have that square edge by putting the angle on the top wall you don't have the gases coming straight into the the piston you have it coming at an angle and it's a little bit less resistance so that's one of the tricks you'll see but also you'll have to recover the cross-sectional area because of that interference and that's why they raise those transfers so much and of course you don't want to widen them too much because going crazy with the width means that ring will go further into the port so they go up you know crazy blowdown numbers you'll see numbers like 18 you know stock it's like 22 or and a lot of that again is just for covering cross-sectional area. There's other reasons, but changing the the top of the transfer and recovering cross-sectional area is the game. But when you do a pop-up, the necessity to do that is less. Okay? And that's why I go there. Now understand that it, when you increase compression a lot, that can take off a little bit of your top end, but it gives it more torque. So really when you look at this set of parts that I'm going to put together it's about a compression increase more than anything else that's really the heart of this whole thing you know I do some other things like try to match up the the intake to the boot because when they are cast or somewhat off-center so I just clean that up a little bit I'm 
not changing the cross-sectional area of the transfers because I want to keep the RPMs right where they are stock. And that's another little, little uh, deal with porting is a lot of times the weakest link in the chain for, for power is the transfers. And since I'm trying to keep the saw in that range plus or minus 500 RPMs from stock, for me to open up the transfers really doesn't, get, doesn't really give me anything. I'm really shooting for torque, easy starting, decent uh, fuel usage more than I am uh, power. Because really, when it comes right to it, the game I'm playing is increasing the efficiency at the RPMs that cylinders designed to run at versus really changing the RPMs. Now the guys who are building really fast saws, well, one of the best ways of making power is make more RPMs. So they will port it and they'll change the configuration of the saw in order to run it at higher RPM, that's where they're getting the power from. And that's not my game. And I understand the benefits of it, but that doesn't suit my world. My world is, you know, I like to keep them a little bit tame. I like the torque. This is more about noise than it is about power. I could do I could do a, a five eighths or or even a three quarter pipe and it would sound good and might increase the power a little bit. I went a little bit larger, and uh, that's as much to tease Bob as anything. It's not gonna make any more power with that larger hole. If anything, it might lose a little bit of power, but. So I guess the summary is this, is um, the goal of this saw, notice I'm already moving into a different project, is to get a 48 millimeter top end, which is sometimes maligned by the, uh, the builders out there because it's smaller board and smaller transfers but it matches what I'm trying to do because of the power characteristics I'm looking for a saw that's going to have a no load um, tuning reference in the 13,000 range up from 12.5 for these stock and I've done some very minor things to the cylinder in order to try to pick up the extra RPMs in a, a small timing change a little bit of work on the transfers. The basic cross-sectional area of those transfers really hasn't changed, so the place where it wants to make power really hasn't changed. And by using these, imagine the, the cross-sectional area of a carburetor is also reduced by the things like the choke and the, and the throttle the diameter of this is ever so slightly larger than a stock one but not so large that there's a big lip between the carburetor and the, and the standard boot you know what I'm saying it's just a little bit and I found these carburetors tweaked properly they work really nice a little goofy you gotta rotate them there's some other issues to expand on the pop-up build the reason why I'm going that way Partly it's because I don't want to do a build that's going to require a lot of machine work because that makes it harder for you guys and you have to go spend money. And my premise is, for what I'm trying to achieve, you can get the power characteristics without having to use a machine tool. To do this properly, really machining the squish band would be required. But that also means reducing the thickness of this flange and there's two things that happen there I talked about it just a little bit in the video one is by reducing that thickness you also reduce the strength and I can tell you um, I've repaired saws where there was a big reduction in this thickness big increasing compression that corresponds to that and these damn things flex you'll see them actually flex down so that's one and the second thing that happens when you lower the the transfer is when the pistons at bottom dead center. I was trying to explain that in the video. This might be a better explanation. I don't know if the camera is going to pick it up, but the pistons at bottom dead center, and this cylinder has been dropped because it's going to have a massive compression increase. And you see the edge of the piston right there. You see the crown of the piston right there where uh, the transfer floor and the roof well this one's been modified but the roof directs the gases as it enters the combustion chamber and it hits that square edge dead on now if you increase the angle 
at the top or the roof of the transverse, it's hitting that piston at a little bit of an angle which promotes flow, which is one of the reasons they do that, like I was saying in the video. And if you do a pop-up, see how you machine the crown just a little bit? That what I call interference is going to be less by whatever the pop-up is. So this one here is going to, this is an old research build I had done on a 350. And I was trying to jack the compression to like 200 pounds. On this cylinder, we're only dropping it, say, 20 thousandths because it's going to have a no base gasket build. And the pop-up is down approximately that same 20 thousandths. So the, the edge of this piston is going to be literally right at the floor of the transfer. At least it should be pretty close. So that whole idea of having the piston interfere with the flow of the transfer as it enters the combustion chamber is going to be minimized. But I'm still going to get my compression increase because of the pop-up. Does that make any sense? So, net, 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 net. I'm looking to get this 48 millimeter, which a lot of guys toss away, which was the beginning of this whole discussion. And why would you throw away a perfectly good OEM cylinder, which is going to outlast any aftermarket out there by orders of magnitude? Why throw it away? So, with some very simple changes that you can do with tools from Lowe's, the original premise of the channel, um, I believe, and I think we're going to prove, that these 48 millimeter cylinders tweaked just right can actually outperform the stock 50 millimeter saws.